The Bible is the inspired word of God. It is the only book that reveals to us the tragic consequences of our choices. Let us study the Bible, for if we do so, we shall find rest for our souls. Good evening, everyone. I didn't quite hear you from the back. Let's try it one more time. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Heavenly Father, something indeed is happening. You've assembled the finest young people in the church into this auditorium. Speak to us and give us a message of hope and encouragement, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You have in your hands some handouts, which is designed to help you follow along in the message. We are going to use our Bibles. Our scripture reading, Proverbs 16, 25, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And then Galatians 6, 7, and 8, be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. This would be the basic framework of the message. And I'm going to begin by telling you the story of a gentleman, his name, William J. Blythe IV. William Blythe IV was born on August 19, 1946, in one of the poorest states in the United States. He was the only child of his mother. Three months before his birth, his father died in a tragic automobile accident. His mother later remarried, and at the age of 15, William was legally adopted by his stepfather. And so for the remainder of his life, he bore the name of his adopted father. William had a difficult childhood, in part because his stepfather was an alcoholic who abused his mother. But in spite of the tremendous odds, he became one of the most influential folks in the 20th century. Though he is not always appreciated in his nation, he is well respected and loved outside this country because people recognize him for his tremendous contribution to world peace and for his concern for the needs of the poor. While he was growing, in his early childhood years, he displayed a solemn attitude towards religion. In his household, which consists of his mother, his stepfather, and his stepbrother, William was the only one who was known to be religious. He would often go to church even before the minister was there to open the doors. While growing because of conflict in the home, he tried to bring peace and harmony between father and mother. And the skills he gained would later prove useful in his solving problems of the world. Though he came from a poor town, and though he studied in a small high school, he excelled in his studies. He attended some of the most prestigious institutions around the world, obtained degrees at Georgetown University, Oxford University, Yale University, where he got his law degree. Afterwards, he went back to his home state. He became a professor, a popular professor, one who cared about people. At the age of 30, he was elected attorney general of his state. Two years later, he became the governor. And in 1992, at the age of 43, he became the president of the United States of America. He served two consecutive terms, and during his presidency, America was ushered into the most prosperous period in its recent history. His full name was William Jefferson Clinton. We know him as Bill Clinton. But as I stated earlier, today Bill Clinton's contribution is not greatly appreciated, partly because of his self-inflicted wounds. His moral problems have tarnished his reputation and great accomplishments. Many Americans forgave Bill Clinton for his moral lapses. He survived an impeachment attempt that would have thrown him out of office. 
He served his full term. And yet, for the rest of his life, Bill Clinton has to live with and suffer the painful consequences of his wrong choice. Even the very mention of his name evokes strong emotion in certain quarters of this country. And that is precisely my point. But you see, Bill Clinton is not alone in suffering from self-inflicted wounds. Wounds people inflict upon themselves because of their own deliberate choices. In a real sense, every one of us is a Bill Clinton, suffering from some self-inflicted wounds. From the day of Adam to our day, men and women are suffering needlessly because of their own deliberate choices. You'll find them in the prison. You'll find some in drug rehabilitation centers. You'll find others in mental institutions, hospitals, homeless shelters, divorce recovery programs. You'll find some on death row and some are in well-kept graves. They are all suffering from the painful consequences of their sin. They are harvesting the fruit of their choices. You see, there is a basic law in nature which basically says we reap what we sow. Sin has unavoidable consequences. And the question is, can it happen to righteous people? Yes. While God forgives sins, it does not mean he removes the consequences. You better believe this. Because there's a new theology floating around even in our church which says, Jesus will forgive you, therefore you can do whatever you want. Ladies and gentlemen, while God forgives sins, he does not always remove the consequences. God will forgive the sin of fornication and adultery, but he will leave the AIDS virus intact. He can forgive the smoker, but the smoker will suffer from damaged lungs. He can forgive a drunkard, but he would not fix his liver. God can forgive an abortion, but he may not restore a perforated or ruptured uterus. What am I saying? The key thought in the message, which you have on your notes, you can fill in the blanks, sin has unavoidable consequences. While God forgives sins, he does not always remove the consequences. Calvary's cross was the penalty for sin, not necessarily its consequences. Until Jesus comes to make all things new, we shall often have to live with the painful consequences of our choice. The wounds will be healed, but the ugly scars will remain. Ellen White says, all those who take part in that which dishonors God bring upon the cause of God a stain not easily effaced. They wound their own souls and will carry the scars throughout their lifetime. This is why we've got to be careful about the choices we make. And to bring home the point, this evening I'm going to open the pages of Scripture to present to you one model of a godly man who made a wrong choice and how he suffered for it. Whenever we ask who is the most righteous person you can think of in the Bible, many would give the names of Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Joseph, and a host of others, and yet few would ever mention the name Lot. And yet the Bible says Lot was a righteous man. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. There we read the account of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and notice how the Bible refers to Lot. In verse 6, the Bible says, God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, and making them an example unto those who should live ungodly. Verse 7, and God delivered just Lot. The word just means righteous man Lot. God delivered a just man Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man, that's the second time he's referred to as righteous, that righteous man, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vex his righteous soul.
from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Three times, Lot is referred to as a righteous man. And yet, hardly any of us ever think of Lot as a righteous man. We know he was a righteous man because even though he lived in a wicked city, he was able to preserve his righteousness. In fact, the Bible says his righteous soul was stirred. It was vexed whenever he saw sin around him. Every one of us enjoys sin, but not righteous Lord. When he saw the television programs in his day, his heart was pained. It's like someone, a Christian, working amongst people who are always cursing. Something happens to you. When he visited the shopping malls and saw the magazines, his heart was pained. When he listened to the music on the radio, something in him boiled. His righteous soul was vexed. He was a righteous man. We know he was a righteous man because he was able to raise two lovely girls who were virgins in an immoral city of Sodom. It takes a righteous man. It takes a lot of family worship, a lot of prayer. We know he was a righteous man because he had two elderly daughters who were married. They had their own husbands. We know he was righteous because at one time when the angels visited and the people of Sodom wanted to sodomize him, out of desperation, he was willing even to offer his best, his two daughters, to be abused by these sodomites. Which father in his right mind will give his children to be abused? Righteous Lord would rather suffer the pain than cause innocent people to suffer. He was a righteous man. But do righteous people suffer needlessly for their stupid mistakes? Yes. And the story of Lot tells us this. When you read Genesis chapter 19, the remainder of the message will be on Genesis 19. Take your Bibles and turn over there. Genesis chapter 19. And you've got to get used to coming to GYC meetings using your Bible. Increasingly, you go to churches, but Bible is not being preached. No wonder we are training a generation of biblical illiterates. Take your Bibles, Genesis chapter 19. The Bible says a time came when Sodom was going to be destroyed, and God sent his angels with a message. If you start reading from verse 12, Genesis chapter 19 and from verse 12. And the man, referring to the angel, said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law, sons, daughters, whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Verse 14, Lot went out and spoke unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. When he told them, get out, his sons-in-law literally laughed him to scorn. They ridiculed him. They ridiculed that old man with superstitious fear. How could Sodom be destroyed? Its homeland security measures were impregnable. It has a powerful anti-terrorist squad. And of course, the popular preachers of Sodom were saying a loving God cannot destroy his creation. For whatever reason, the sons-in-law mocked Brother Lot. But Lot was not willing to give up. He was concerned still for the salvation of his two married daughters and his sons-in-law. He pleaded with them. He wouldn't leave right away. In fact, had it not been for the angels who literally dragged him out, he would even have lost his life. You read it from verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are with you here, lest you be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon him. Notice, he lingered, he delayed. While he lingered, the men laid hold upon his son, upon the hand of his wife, upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and sent him without the city. Lot was delayed, and they had to drag him out. In fact, 
Afterwards, if you read from verse 24, the Bible says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that we grew upon the ground. God destroyed everything, including Lot's business, but amongst the dead were his two married daughters and his two sons-in-law. Have you ever lost two lovely children in a day? Or brothers or sisters in a day? Can you imagine attending a funeral? Empty casket. Two freshly dug graves. That was the experience of Brother Lot. He lost all overnight. But there was more he lost. He also lost Mrs. Lot. When you read verse 26, the Bible says, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of, of salt. Lot lost everything because of a foolish mistake. According to Ellen White, if you read Petrus and Prophets, page 161, Lot's delay, his lingering, was partially responsible for the loss and the death of Mrs. Lot. Let me read it to you. If Lot himself had manifested no hesitancy to obey the angel's warning, but had earnestly fled toward the mountains without one word of pleading or remonstrance, his wife also would have made her escape. The influence of his example would have saved her from the sin that sealed her doom. But his hesitancy and delay caused her to lightly regard the divine warning. Not only did Lot lose everything he had, and his two children and sons-in-law, he lost Mrs. Lot. And for the remainder of his life, he had to live with the pain that his delay caused him to lose his wife. Any time he sat at dinner table and saw salt, he remembered that he was responsible, at least partially, for the wife's death. But there's another thing Brother Lot lost. While he fled, the Bible tells us he went and found himself in a cave. If you start reading verse 30, the Bible says, And Lot went up out of Zohar and dwelt in the mountain and dwelt, that dwelt in Zohar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Can you imagine a man who was used to city life, suddenly reduced to a primitive caveman? like an Osama bin Laden. Used to electricity and the latest gadgets of technology, suddenly he had to start life all over again because of one foolish mistake we'll talk about. But there was more lot lost. If you keep reading from verse 31, the Bible tells us he lost his self-respect. And for the remainder of his life, he lived as a disgraced man. you find this when you start reading from verse 31. While they were hiding in the cave, Lot and his two cave girls, those two virgin girls, the Bible tells us, the firstborn of those virgins said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come. Let us make our father drink wine and will lie with him that he may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with their father, and he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the first said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday night with my father. Let's make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him that he may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose, lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son, called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bare a son, called his name Benami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon to this day. While they were hiding in the cave, the seed that was sowed in Sodom sprang up. These girls discovered that there were no eligible young men in the entire area for them to marry. Their father, their righteous father was growing old and he would soon die without a seed 
no posterity, and they were concerned about the legacy of their father. And they themselves couldn't stand the thought of living without husbands. And so they did what the popular culture of the day had taught them. They mixed some wine in their father's juice. I'm trying to think how they did it. Or they put it in his bread or cake. You know, like what happens on secular university campuses. They literally drugged their father. And in the language of today, they raped their father. They became pregnant. Nine months later, they got children by their father. And Lot was known in the entire area as that hopeless man who fathered children with his own daughters. He lived a life of disgrace. All because of one decision, Lot lost his wealth, he lost his two married daughters, his sons-in-law, he lost his wife, he was reduced to a primitive caveman, and then for the remainder of his life, his self-respect. But why? Why did Lot suffer so much? It was all because of one foolish choice, which he made years ago. He made a fatal choice. When you flip your Bible backwards to Genesis chapter 13, it tells us it happened when Lot was with his uncle Abraham. They had a large stock of cattle and livestock. And there was a fight between the headsmen of Abraham and the headsmen of Lot. And Abraham went to Lot and said, look, we are brothers. Let's not fight. If you start reading from verse 7 of Genesis chapter, 7, uh, chapter 13, Genesis 13 from verse 7, Abraham told him, look, we are brothers, verse 8. Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my headsmen and your headsmen, for we are brothers. Isn't the whole land before us? If you want to go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you want the left, I'll go to the right. And what would Lot do? He was the younger. He should have given the uncle the preference. But what did brother Lot do? Righteous Lot. Verse 10. Lot lifted up his eyes. He beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. And verse 11, Lot chose, he made a choice. He chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated themselves, the one from another. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Notice that preposition, toward Sodom. Sodom was a businessman's dream. It was a place of commerce and profit. All the banks, innovations, stock brokerage company, latest technology was in Sodom. It had Ivy League universities. I'm sure we will say there was Sodom State University. We had the University of Gomorrah, which has fantastic football and basketball games. Sodom was a place of profit, like Sacramento, like New York, Chicago, and the, building, and the cities of the world. Sodom was a popular tourist center, a vacation spot, a place of fun and activities. You can almost think of the Dead Palm Parade and its pounding music in Sodom. There might have been olive grove beauty contests in Sodom. The Sodom and Gomorrah annual Oscar Award Nights, which paraded beautiful girls on the TV screens of Sodom. I'm actually talking about today. And of course, there was a lot of music in Sodom, from heavy to soft rock, rhythm and blue, rip, a rap, hip hop, gospel rock. Even the church in Sodom has its own brand of rock music masqueraded as praise worship. And of course, there was sex in Sodom. Different kinds of sex. Sex before marriage was no longer fornication, it was a relationship. Have you noticed it's neutral? Sex outside of marriage was not adultery, it was an affair. It almost sounds like you are working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Neutral. 
the promiscuous who was sleeping around was not promiscuous. He was only multi-friended. And of course, there were different kinds of uh, expressions of uh, sexuality, from homosexuality to bisexuality and everything in between. Even the church in Sodom believed there was nothing wrong with homosexuality. They even ordained gay bishops in Sodom. And some were even pushing for gay marriage in Sodom. I'm talking about today. You see, Sodom was not a place for Christians. But Lot, righteous Lot, pitched his tent toward Sodom. He did not settle in downtown Sodom. It was too violent. He settled in the outskirts of Sodom, the suburbs. But before long, the man who had pitched his tent toward Sodom was living right inside Sodom. By the time you come to Genesis chapter 14 and verse 12, the Bible tells us, and Lot was dwelling in Sodom. The preposition has changed from toward to in. One little step led to another. You see, after frequent trips to Sodom, Lot became convinced that he should move nearer the market. It will cut down the cost of transportation in his business. He could sell his milk fresh. He could easily ship his wool. And his business partners convinced him that in order to remain competitive, move your business to downtown Sodom. I'm sure Mrs. Lot also convinced righteous Lot to move to Sodom. She will get all the latest bargains from the big stores in downtown Sodom. You don't get sales at the suburbs. And she will listen to the Sodom Symphony at Orchestra Hall in Sodom. I want to believe that the two young girls, the virgin girls, also convinced that to move to Sodom. They will be nearer to their big sisters and what will strengthen family values than being with big sisters. And of course, these two girls didn't like their Jordan Valley Junior Academy. They wanted Twin City High School so they could score high grades on their SAT and get scholarship to Sodom State University. For whatever reason, Lot, righteous man Lot, the man who pitched his tent towards Sodom, found himself in downtown Sodom. And in the city, he lived in a house. In fact, he was at the gate. And scholars suggest that he rose to be a mayor. Ellen White says, Lot owed his prosperity to Abraham. But instead of giving preference to his uncle in that choice, he was dazzled by visions of profit. I've put in your notes there, and you can fill in the blanks. Petrus and Prophets 133. Dazzled with visions of worldly gain, Lot overlooked the moral and spiritual evils that would be encountered there. The inhabitants of the plain were sinners before the Lord exceedingly, but of this he was ignorant, or knowing, gave it little weight. He chose him all the plain of Jordan and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Notice the last sentence. How little did he foresee the terrible results of that selfish choice? Let me repeat it. How little did he foresee the terrible results of that selfish choice? What Lot did not foresee, he later saw clearly. His business was gone. His married daughters dead. His sons-in-law dead. His wife dead. Reduced to a primitive caveman. His self-respect gone. And later, the Ammonites and the Moabites, the descendants from that incestuous relationship, will become the enemies of Israel. Ellen White says, Petrus and Prophet 167, Lot's only posterity, the Moabites and Ammonites were vile, idolatrous tribes, rebels against God, and bitter enemies of his people. Think about it. The legacy of this righteous man was a nation of rebels. 
Two nations that would always fight with God's people. All because of one foolish choice. Throughout his life, in Sodom, Lot was not a happy man. And now he lives in a cave in shame. Was Lot's sin forgiven? Yes. But did he pay for the consequences of his wrong choice? Absolutely. The self-inflicted wounds were healed, but the ugly scars remained. Being righteous did not save him from the consequences of his wrong choice. In fact, after he moved into downtown Sodom, Sodom was conquered by some nations and Lot was captured. His uncle Abraham came to his rescue, but after being rescued, he went straight back to Sodom. Had he not allowed selfishness to guide his life, he would have spared himself these terrible suffering from self-inflicted wounds. Notice what Ellen White says. It is in your notes, Petrus and Prophets 168, talking about Lot. He was saved at last as a brand plucked out of the fire, yet he was stripped of his possessions, bereaved of his wife. In other words, his wife died. His wife and children dwelling in caves like the wild beasts, covered with infamy in his old age. That is disgrace in his old age. He gave to the world not a race of righteous men, but two idolatrous nations at enmity with God and warring upon his people until their cup of iniquity being full, they were appointed to destruction. Then the next sentence. How terrible were the results that followed one unwise step. Let me say it again. How terrible were the results that followed one unwise step. Ladies and gentlemen, one unwise step is all it takes to reap some consequences. Abraham made one unwise step in marrying Hagar. And now we are still battling with the war in the Middle East. One unwise step. Adam and Eve thought it was just a simple fruit. One unwise step. Esau thought it was just a little meal. What's wrong with eating a little meal? He lost his birthright. One unwise step. And I can repeat the names, Jeroboam, all these individuals suffered the painful consequences afterwards. The wounds were healed, but the ugly scars remained. Brothers and sisters, we stand in great danger of repeating the mistakes of these Bible characters. Some of you started out as godly and splendid Christians. You used to study the Bible, pray, attend summer school. Somehow you got off track, went to college, or started hanging out with the wrong crowd, and all it took was that one unwise step, and you find yourself in trouble. One unwise step of skipping summer school is all it takes, of studying your Bible, of holding someone's hand in the dark and kissing him or her is all it takes. One unwise step step. Watching a particular movie or visiting a particular internet site you shouldn't visit. One unwise step and you would lose it. One unwise step of careless dressing. You will ruin yourself and trip other people. That is why GYC insists that if you come here, you better dress up and shape up. Don't believe any leader who tells you you can dress casually and carelessly. They are putting you down. God will never lower his standards. What he has promised is he will lift you up to meet the standards. Anyone who lowers the standard doesn't mean you well. One unwise step is all it takes. One unwise step of a course, of a career, of a place to study, 
Ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he or she will reap. One unwise step in the choice of friendship. One unwise step of a lifestyle. Even how you eat. The food you place on your plate. That little extra fat. You will live for the remainder of your life working and sweating it out. One unwise step. You better believe it. Ask your parents. Somehow along the line they wanted to get married and their parents told them, don't marry him, don't marry her, but they decided to go their own way and now they are reaping the baneful consequences of that foolish choice. One unwise step. One unwise attitude of rebellion and arrogance is all it takes. Why am I saying this to you? We stand at the verge of the second coming of the Lord. And the Lord is waiting for a generation of young men and women who will dare to be all they can be. Whole institutions have been lost because of one foolish choice of its leader. Churches have been split apart and destroyed because of one foolish choice of a music. And it has set young people off track. One foolish choice. That is why here at GYC, we don't believe in applause. There is a place for applause, but not in the context of worship. Because when you applaud a person who sings, you are exposing that person to danger. Pride sets in, and it will ruin him. Hollywood doesn't know how to say amen, and so they use applause. The more intense your applause and the longer, the better you are, and it tightens your ego. In the house of God, we say amen. What do you say to that? Amen. One unwise step. Even as a church, we have made certain choices that have lived with us. One unwise step. We wanted to enjoy money so bad from IRS, and we are split in the church. GYC, the Lord is waiting upon you. He counts upon you. You represent the finest generation of young men in our generation. As I told you three years ago, in 1844, James White was 23 years old. Ellen White was 17. J.N. Andrews, 15. Uriah Smith, 12. They were young people. Godly, dedicated, brilliant. And where did we get this idea? That to be a young person, you have to clown and listen to entertainment as a show that you are worshiping the Lord. We can do better. And that is why you are here this week. You will be trained. But more than just an intellectual training, you will be put to work. The only group of young people who can finish God's work are men and women who are diligent, who are godly, and who have a passion for evangelism. Perhaps as I bring this to a close, I need to read to you the statements on your notes. Ellen White has statements about these choices. Common sins, however insignificant they may be regarded, will impair your moral sense and extinguish the inward impression of the Spirit of God. All evil works ruin to those who commit it. God may and will forgive the repenting sinner, but though forgiving, the soul is marred, and the power of the elevated thought possible to the unimpaired mind is destroyed. Through all time, the soul bears the scars. Let me read another statement. This she wrote to a businessman who was engaged in crooked business deals. What did that dishonest man gain from his worldly policy? How high a price he did pay for his success. He has sacrificed his noble manhood and has started on the road that leads to perdition. He may be converted. He may see the wickedness of his injustices to his fellow men as far as possible and make restitution. But the scars of a wounded conscience will ever remain. Writing to young people, Ellen White says, 
Any low gratification, any self-indulgence is a scar left upon the soul and the noble powers of mind are corrupted. There may be repentance, but the soul is crippled and will wear its scars through all time. Writing to students in our institutions, she said, I entreat the students in our schools to be sober-minded. The frivolity of the young is not pleasing to God. Those who take the lead in these frivolities bring upon the cause a stain not easily effaced. They wound their own souls and will carry the scars through their lifetime. And then to ministers, I call upon you who minister in sacred things to be converted. Now is your time to seek a preparation and readiness for the fearful test which is before us. Now it may be you can repent, but even if pardon is written against your names, you will sustain terrible loss for the scars you've made upon your souls will remain. Ladies and gentlemen, your wounds may be healed, but the ugly scars remain. That is why on this opening night of GYC, I want to invite you to make the right choices. I've invited Christina Paul, a violinist, Sunny Kim, a pianist, and Jeremy Morada, a singer, to sing a special song for us. But as they do so, I want to make a special appeal to you. If the Lord has been speaking to you tonight, perhaps you can identify with righteous Lord who made one foolish mistake and he lost everything. Tonight, the Lord will call upon you to make that choice. If the Lord has been speaking to you and you want tonight to be the night you want to dedicate your life fully to the Lord Jesus Christ by making one good choice, because just as a bad choice has ugly consequences, a good choice brings within its train positive results. If this is your wish to make that decision tonight, I would invite you wherever you are to stand for prayer even as they sing, wherever you are. Don't stand because everyone is standing. Stand because you mean it as they sing to us that special music. I've wandered far away from God Now I'm coming home The paths of sin too long I've trod Lord, I'm coming commitment to give yourself fully to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Telling him, Lord, I've wandered far away, but this night I want to come home. I want to make a commitment to serve you, to live for you, 
to study your word, to live in harmony with every truth you have revealed. As I sing the song, if there is anyone here who feels the call, the longing to give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ in a very tangible way, I would invite you to come forward. Seal your decision by coming forward. The Lord will be with you as they sing the next stanza. Come forward, those of you who want to make tonight that turning point in your life. God bless you as you come forward. for a long time, you were born in the church, you've gone through all the motions, but you've never truly seriously given your life to the Lord. Some of you are here, not Adventists, or even Adventists, you've never really made a decision for baptism, and you want this day to be the time you took that decision, you will later on go and study. This is also a moment for you to make a decision. There are some of you also who have been fighting the Lord Jesus Christ all these years. But God made it possible, bringing you here at this time. Why not come home? Whoever you are, wherever you may be, as you listen to the next stanza, I would invite you to come home. This may be the most important decision you would make in your life. Don't delay. My only hope, my only plea, Lord, I'm coming home, that Jesus died and died for me. choice you have made tonight will be the most important choice. Not only would you be blessed by those within your sphere of influence will be blessed by the choice you have made. I pray that it will be recorded in the books of heaven that on December 15, 2004, when the Lord spoke at the General Youth Conference in Sacramento, there were young men and women who came home. May this be the most important decision in your life. Let us bow our heads for prayer as the song plays. Father in heaven, we thank you for tonight, for the decisions that have been made. All over the world, you are calling your children, men and women, to come home. And tonight, they have come. Many carry ugly scars through self-inflicted wounds. Father, though the skulls may remain, give them the grace to endure and shield us from repeating such mistakes. We ask that your spirit will sustain every one of them, will forgive their sins and give them power to live victorious life. 
Thank you, Lord, for what you are doing, what you will be doing throughout this weekend, and may this be a life-transforming experience, for we ask in Jesus' name.